Welcome to the Arabic Hour. My name is Ayman Rajah, your host for this segment. With me today is Jeff Klein, who isn't a stranger to the Arabic Hour. Jeff, welcome. Thank you. Glad to be here. Today we'll be talking about Syria, uh, be it the uh, 10th anniversary of, uh, of the conflict. Um, let me uh, first ask you, what took you to Syria? What got you interested and uh, got you involved in this conflict? So, you know, I've been going to the Middle East uh, initially to uh, Palestine and uh, 48 Israel for many years and have been, you know, involved in writing and solidarity activity with the Palestinian movement. And at some point, quite a while back, I started visiting uh, Lebanon on the way to or from Palestine and got really interested in, in Lebanese uh, politics and history. And, and one time in 2010, uh, I started my uh, trip in Lebanon. And at that time, before the uh, crisis, it was quite normal to go from Lebanon to Jordan and then from Jordan uh, across the Alamey Bridge to the West Bank overland. You know, you know, you could take a car or a taxi to Damascus and then a car or a taxi to Dera and, uh, and then Irbid. And so that's what I did one year uh, and uh, spent a week in Syria on the way. And uh, since then, of course, since the crisis, it's been a little more complicated and difficult to get to Syria. But I managed to go in 2016 with a group of foreigners that was led by Palestinians, actually. Uh, and then in 2018 with another group. Uh, uh, and both times spent uh, uh, the first time a week or so and the second time a couple of weeks in uh, Syria. And... Uh, traveled around a lot of the country, uh, obviously not all of it, but uh, uh, saw a lot, met a lot of people, and uh, I also have become friends with uh, Syrians here in the United States, Syrian Americans, uh, who sometimes have a point of view that's very different from the one that normally gets reported uh, from Syria. So I've started to write about Syria. If you Google Jeff Klein plus Syria, you can find a, you know, a dozen or so articles I've written about uh, Syria in history and the conflict, and I'll talk about some of that today, obviously, but you can read more uh, online if you uh, find some of my articles. All right, excellent. And I understand today you have a, a presentation that uh, you'd like to present to us on Syria. I do. I guess I want to start with uh, dealing with some of the misconceptions that a lot of people have about Syria. And I don't blame people for that because, uh, you know, our media has covered Syria in such an inaccurate and one-sided way that it's very difficult for people to get a real understanding of the situation there. And what I'm showing in this picture is uh, uh, an illustration for an article in The Economist magazine, which is what people think of, most Americans think of, when they think of uh, the uh, crisis in Syria. Uh, it shows uh, Bashar al-Assad, uh, you know, as the sort of sole dictator of Syria, standing on the ruins of his country. And, you know, the story behind that is that, you know, he's an individual dictator. Everyone in Syria hates him. The country has been destroyed, and uh, he has no support whatsoever. He's a criminal monster that has no support in Syria and has destroyed his country. Now... Uh, those views are either entirely or partly wrong in almost every aspect. And I'll try to get into a little bit of the, uh, of why. Uh, but, uh, first of all, on the issue of, uh, you know, Bashar al-Assad as a dictator, of course, Syria is not a democracy. And Syrians deserve something much better than the government they have. But it's also not an individual dictatorship. Uh, Syria is ruled by the Ba'ath Socialist Party, and Assad is the, uh, the ruler, of the, the leader of that, but he doesn't rule as an individual dictator. You know, rather it's a one-party state, uh, and in fact, the Ba'ath Party has a significant social base within Syria that I'll get to later on. Uh, as for the country being destroyed, uh, it's true that in 10 years of war, a lot of the country has been badly damaged. Uh, this is a picture I took of Homs in uh, 2016, 
and there was heavy fighting in Homs, uh, uh, and uh, not, you know, just from the government side, but, you know, from both sides, from the armed uh, opposition and the government, and there are neighborhoods in Homs like this one that were pretty badly damaged. Uh, on the other hand, it's, uh, it's also true that uh, the government of Syria was not the only cause of damage in the country. Uh, U.S. intervention uh, and the intervention of its allies, particularly uh, the U.S. Air Force, flattened the city of Raqqa uh, a few years later. And uh, this was the U.S. Air Force and not the, uh, the Syrian Air Force that did it. Uh, but if the Syrian government does it to fight against uh, rebels and uh, armed rebels that are uh, trying to overthrow it, that's a war crime. But this, what you're looking at, is not a war crime. This is democracy in action. Uh, the reality is that lots of uh, Syria is, uh, is relatively intact. And even uh, some Syrians in the United States and others who are really interested have this idea, for example, that Aleppo was destroyed by Assad. And, of course, there was fighting, particularly in the eastern part of the city, but the larger part of Aleppo is, as you see here, intact. This was a picture that was taken after the end of the major fighting uh, in Aleppo. And, of course, Damascus is uh, also largely intact. Both in Aleppo and Damascus, although the physical infrastructure is, is, is intact, of course, people did. There were casualties from bombardments and uh, rockets and mortars from uh, the, the militants who were opposing the government. Uh, and uh, since uh, uh, Aleppo was retaken, the rest of Aleppo was retaken by the government, there's been a substantial amount of reconstruction. And I don't know if you can see it uh, on the lower right. There's, uh, there's a, uh, a neighborhood in eastern Aleppo that was badly damaged, and now it's up and repaired and sort of a vital part of a functioning part of the city again. And the larger picture that you're looking at is near the citadel of Aleppo, which, of course, is a great landmark. And when I was there in 2018, uh, the cafes uh, and restaurants that are around the Citadel, which were very popular before the, the crisis, are now peopled again. They're, they're reopened, peopled by families and, you know, drinking tea, coffee, uh, uh, shisha. And, uh, you know, the city is being rebuilt and coming to life, even the parts that were badly damaged. Now, I want to step back a little bit because... You know, we live in a world that, that was really created by colonialism. The world we live in is, you know, has, it wouldn't be the same world if it weren't colonialism. And that's more true of the Middle East than any other region on the planet. And I want to remind the viewers, sometimes the, uh, the residue of colonialism is in plain sight, but we don't notice it. And uh, I, I like to point out, why do we call this part of the globe the Middle East? Uh, you know, east and west are directions on, the, on the, the planet, the round planet. They're not places. And it's the Middle East only because from the point of view of European colonialism, it was the middle, or sometimes they call it the Near East, compared to their colonial possessions in what they call the Far East, in India, Indonesia, uh, the Philippines, and so on. So Middle East, the, the term Middle East, is entirely a creation of colonialism. But it's become so embedded in our thinking that even Arabs who live there call it the Middle East. Correct. Even though it makes no sense. It certainly makes no sense in the absence of understanding about colonialism. So we wouldn't have the Middle East that we have today if not for colonialism. Colonialism doesn't explain everything about the Middle East as it is today. But if you don't understand the colonial history of the Middle East, you can understand what's going on today because it's still very much an influence in terms of what's happening day to day. Now, uh, going back even further, most of what we call the Middle East today uh, was originally uh, part of the Ottoman Empire going back hundreds of years, and also uh, uh, North Africa as well. And over the centuries uh, leading up to the First World War, the European uh, powers had little by little uh, taken and annexed the, the North African parts of the Ottoman Empire, as you see here, Algeria you know, from 1830, Libya 1911, Egypt uh, after the building of the Suez Canal from the 1880s, and so on. So that by uh, 100 years ago, at the eve of the First World War, the Ottoman Empire was reduced to what you see in green there. That is, 
present-day Turkey, uh, Syria, parts of Iraq, and the coast of Arabia. And uh, World War I was an opportunity of the Europe for the European colonial powers to gobble up the rest of the Ottoman Empire. Particularly the British were concerned because uh, if you uh, look here, the Suez Canal, uh, Ottoman control of the coast of Arabia was regarded as uh, somewhat threatening to their route to the Far East, to India and the Far East. So it was very strategic. And uh, they understood and had planned that when, they, when uh, the Ottoman Empire entered the war, the First World War, assuming the Allies won, that they would carve it up. It was very uh, clear from the beginning. Now, the early, uh, the first year or so of the war uh, in the East, in the Middle East, didn't go very well for the British. And they were looking for allies. And the ally that they settled on uh, was uh, uh, Sheriff Hussein, the ruler of Mecca, who, in exchange for a promise from the British to set up an independent Arab state in the Arab-speaking parts of the Ottoman Empire, agreed to uh, launch a revolt against uh, the Ottomans, uh, allied with the British. Uh, and he was promised in return that most of the former Ottoman territories would be under a new independent Arab state. Meanwhile, though, in secret, the British and the French uh, made their own deal uh, to divide up in spheres of influence uh, the Ottoman territories, the Arabic-speaking Ottoman territories, in the famous Sykes-Picot Agreement, which people are starting to know about now. But, you know, before the 21st century, very few people, uh, especially non-Arabs, knew anything about this. It was a secret agreement in, uh, in 1915 and 16, uh, secret from the Arabs, who were supposed to be independent, that said, no, they're not going to be independent. They're going to be divided up in spheres of influence between the, between the French and the British. And what became Palestine uh, was going to be jointly ruled by the European powers. This was the Sykes-Picot, the Holy Land was going to be jointly ruled. This was the Sykes-Picot Agreement, uh, which again promised a, a different solution to the, uh, the Arabic uh, lands of uh, the Ottoman Empire. And meanwhile, in 1917, the British had promised Palestine to the Zionist movement, so that Palestine was promised three times, in effect. It was, it was supposed to be part of an Arab state. Then it was supposed to be internationally ruled by the European powers. And finally, it was promised to the Zionists. All of this uh, denied the agreement that the British had made with the Arabs, which was to give them independence in return for their uprising. And at the end of the First World War, the British and French uh, informally uh, renegotiated the Sykes-Picot Agreement. Uh, because the Russians that were originally part of it were out of the picture, uh, they took the uh, opportunity to redivide it themselves. And uh, sometimes truth is stranger than fiction. Uh, the British Prime Minister Lloyd George and the French Prime Minister Clemenceau had a little stroll in the garden of the French Embassy in London and had this conversation in which uh, uh, Clemenceau asked, what do you want? And Lloyd George said Mosul. Mosul was originally going to be part of the French uh, sphere of influence, but there was oil in Mosul, and the British wanted it. And Clemenceau said, okay. And then he said, what else do you want? And the British said, Palestine. And Clemenceau said, okay, too. And this is the way the Middle East was divided up. Uh, yeah. And <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's incredible that this could, this could happen. And by the way, by this time, the U.S. had entered the war supposedly uh, to make the world safe for democracy. Yeah, of course. It's, it's, always, it's, always, it's always, that's always been the, uh, let's keep the world safe for democracy. We have to go and help these people become yeah, yeah. more democratic. And that's still going on. And in those days, a democracy, it wasn't said, but it was understood that democracy was for white Americans and Europeans, uh, not for colonial people. And in fact, in all the vast colonial holdings of the British and French primarily, not a single one of them became independent after the First World War. Many of them had to fight very hard for independence after the Second World War, a generation later. So uh, World War I was fought to make the world safe for colonialism, not to make the world safe for democracy. <laughs> Absolutely. Well put. So meanwhile... Uh, the, the family of Sheriff Hussein and his sons, believing in the British promises, 
after the Ottomans were kicked out of Syria, went to Damascus, and he was declared king of Syria. This is Faisal, the son of, uh, of uh, Hussein. And uh, the nationalist movement, which was based in Damascus and Aleppo, uh, nominated him as king of Syria, uh, but he only uh, ruled for a few months. The French marched in uh, and kicked him out. Uh, despite, as you see in the upper right, despite uh, a lot of demonstrations and opposition, uh, the French had the predominant military power. And by the way, as good colonialists, why uh, use French troops when you had African colonial troops at your disposal? And those are the troops that actually conquered Syria in 1920 and 21. It was uh, mostly Senegalese led by uh, European, French European officers. Correct, and, and, and that's, uh, that's a fact that uh, very, very few people uh, uh, know about. Yeah, so French, it wasn't actually white French men that were fighting. That's right. That's right. You know, whenever possible, uh, the colonial powers tried to rule, uh, not using their own troops, but native troops or colonial troops. And of course, the British really uh, uh, perfected that model in India. Correct. That is, the Indian army was Indians with uh, with British officers. Uh, so uh, Faisal was kicked out. Uh, and uh, became unemployed, and the British were trying to figure out what to do with him, and they held a conference in Cairo in uh, 1921, in which they determined that Faisal, who was now unemployed as the king of Syria, would become the king of Iraq, and his brother Abdullah, uh, the other son of Hussein, would become first the emir and later the king of Transjordan, that eventually became the modern uh, country of Jordan, which is ruled by his great grandson today. Uh, now, so if we look at the map of the Middle East, you can see that it very closely followed the Sykes Picot spheres of influence. Uh, and uh, as the countries became independent eventually, uh, some not until the 50s uh, or even later, uh, it follows the map that was created by the colonial powers. And that's why uh, we see the borders that we see today, even though everyone understood at the time and in the world that Syria was not the small Syria that exists today. It was Blad uh that included most of what we call the Levant today. That is uh, Syria, Lebanon, part of Turkey, Palestine, and part of Egypt. That was what was understood as Syria. So even on maps on the left is a map of Syria from a U.S. atlas from the 1850s that shows Syria, including the entire Levant. Uh, instead of independence in that form, which would have been a major uh, country with lots of resources, uh, what had been one cultural geographical area was divided up into a half a dozen countries, Palestine, Jordan, Lebanon, Part of it went to Iraq, part of it went to Turkey, and so on. Uh, so modern-day Syria is just a fragment of what would have been an independent Arab state along the whole Levant. And so this is the French mandate of Syria after the part uh, on the east that was given to the British. Uh, and uh, they also understood that even in this smaller Syria, it was beneficial, as it always is to the colonial powers, to divide and rule. That is, the danger uh, to the colonists, colonialists is, uh, you know, a, a unified national movement. So they divided up the Syrian mandate. They gave part of it to be an independent greater Lebanon here. <coughs> they eventually gave part of it to Turkey as a deal on the eve of the Second World War to sort of placate them. And then the rest, they divided up the, the heartland of Syrian nationalism were the big cities, the Sunni cities, mostly Sunni then cities of Aleppo and Damascus, they divided them into two different states, two different countries in effect, and they set up an Alawite state here along the coast and a Druze state uh, in the southern part of Syria. Again, a way of dividing people up and uh, pitting one part of the colonized people against another, and this had uh, important repercussions that exist today because from the French point of view, the, uh, the Sunni, urban Sunnis were the, you know, the most danger of nationalism. Uh, the Syrians promoted the Alawites and the Druze 
as a sort of counterweight, as rural people counterweight to the uh, to the uh, Sunni urban people, and therefore made strenuous efforts to recruit them into the colonial army. And that's why the Assad family and uh, a lot of their relatives who are of Alawite uh, origin came to be professional soldiers under the French mandate and then afterwards. And that's part of what set the stage for uh, the rule by Hafez al-Assad and his son Bashar, uh, because they had military support and they had military experience. So just to remind everybody, this colonialism is not ancient history, even though the events I was talking about are about a century old. Uh, the British Empire, upon which the sun never set, as I like to say, has been replaced by the U.S. global empire. And uh, it's quite remarkable. The U.S. empire is not an empire of direct colonies like the British was. It's an empire of military control and bases. And it's quite remarkable. If you look here in the upper left, the entire planet has been divided up by the Americans into military commands. Uh, and the one that's in charge of the Middle East is called Central Command or CENTCOM. And ironically, uh, of course, the Middle East is pretty far from the United States. The headquarters of CENTCOM is in Tampa, Florida, 7,500 miles away from the Middle East. But there are U.S. bases throughout the, uh, the region. And it's safe to say, if you look at this map, by the way, Turkey is not in the Central Command because as a NATO country, it's part of Europe, quote unquote, and therefore it's part of the European Command. Uh, but it, on this map, there's U.S. military involvement in every single country in the Middle East. Sometimes it's bases, sometimes it's uh, giving or selling arms, training, uh, you know, uh, uh, all kinds of bilateral agreements. So the U.S. has a military presence everywhere directly in the Middle East, with the exception of Iran, and hopefully that uh, is not just temporary. Uh, so, so the Middle East today is not ruled by, uh, in effect, by the British and the French as it was 100 years ago. It's ruled by the U.S. and its clients. And, uh, and as we talk about Syria, uh, you, know, I'll talk, you know, get specific, just to be clear, the U.S. claims to be supporting democracy in Syria, but its allies in the Middle East are not democracies. None of them are. Uh, and before we overthrow a government like the one in Syria that we don't like, it might be prudent to at least stop supporting the dictatorships in the other countries in the Middle East that we, uh, that we sell weapons or give, in the case of Israel, give weapons to. So the whole democracy stance of the U.S. in the Middle East is pretty fake. You know, I mean, anyone who thinks twice about it will know that it's, just not legitimate. It's just an excuse. And by the way, after the uh, the initial success of the Iraq uh, invasion in 2003, the Americans, like their European predecessors, began thinking about rearranging the map of the Middle East. And there was a whole series of proposals and 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 position papers to create a Kurdish state and divide up. Uh, Iraq and Saudi Arabia and so on, and this is one version that was floated around uh, uh, in those years after 2003 before the Iraq invasion got to be a lot more complicated than the U.S. had expected. So this is what colonial powers do, right? They rewrite the map. And uh, uh, the Americans, uh, or at least some Americans, are still trying to rewrite the map by supporting uh, Kurdish independence or autonomy on, in Syria. Well, the, the old adage always works, right? Divide and, uh, and you That's can... That's right, divide and rule. Yeah. And by the way, this history is one reason why uh, Syrians of almost every political view are adamantly uh, opposed to any effort to sort of redraw the borders or divide up their country. Uh, because they have experienced this in their history. And whatever the... You know, the, you know, the, the, the failings of uh, the Syrian state as it has been they recognize that dividing up the country at the, at the insistence of the imperial powers is not something they want to see again. Well, and they've seen examples. I mean, yes. uh, Iraq next door, uh, Libya, uh, you know, so many examples where what happened in these uh, countries uh, uh, to bring democracy and to make it a democratic state 
became a, uh, to say the least, a total nightmare for yeah. everybody and anybody living in, in those countries. So I hope anyone watching this will at least understand that whatever the U.S. is trying to do in Syria, it doesn't have much to do with democracy. Uh, and that's really an important point. So even within Syria, again, after the, uh, the crisis began in, in 2011, uh, they started talking about dividing up Syria, as you see here, uh, under this idea that, like the French, that there would be maybe an Alawite state, a Druze state, and a Kurdish state, and maybe the rest could, could stay uh, Syria. And as I said, Syrians of all political opinions are opposed to anything like this. And not only that, it's completely impractical. Uh, Syria, like the rest of the Middle East, is an ethnic mosaic. There's no part of Syria that's ethnically purely one group or another. Uh, Syrians are uh, almost all Arabic speakers. Kur for Kurds, it's sometimes their second language. But among the Arabic speakers, there are Sunni Muslims, Shia Muslims, Alawites, Druze, Christians of many, many different sects. And, uh, and, and there's no area of Syria, including what we call Kurdistan today, where, you know, there's a homogeneous uh, majority of one group or another. So it would be impossible to divide up Syria or any other part of the Middle East unless you have the idea of ethnically cleansing and, create, and moving people around uh, to, to make it pure. So there's no dividing up Syria uh, without, you know, tremendous hardship, although imperialists sometimes like to make maps and, you know, fantasize about this stuff. Well, it's, it's interesting that uh, we continuously uh, uh, talk about uh, uh, division uh, when it comes to right. the Middle East and, and, and we break it down into uh, small, uh, you know, minorities and then uh, within the minority we, we break it down to even smaller segments of society. And some of uh, you viewers will know that it's always been Israeli policy to fragment uh, Arab states around it, uh, uh, particularly by supporting ethnic or religious minorities. They did that in Lebanon uh, with the Maronite Christians. Uh, they have a very close relationship with the Kurds in Iraq and, uh, and in uh, uh, Syria. And this is the idea of fragmenting these states into sort of small competing ethnic uh, enclaves, which benefits the major powers, would benefit Israel and certainly benefits uh, America and the European powers that want the Middle East to be weak and dependent. Uh, by the way, as a symbol of the sort of multi-ethnic, multi-religious uh, character of Syria, uh, you can't get a better uh, view of that than in the old city of Damascus, uh, where you have churches. There are supposed to be 14 different Christian uh, churches in, uh, in Syria, you know, Greek Orthodox, Latin, uh, Armenian, and so on. And in the old city, you can see churches of every denomination uh, right next to uh, mosques, uh, uh, you know, Muslim mosques next door. And historically, for the most part, uh, there was not a high tension between, uh, you know, the different religious confections, especially in modern times when Syrian sort of nationality became, you know, the umbrella on which they all function. So Syria is and was a multi-ethnic uh, country, especially in the cities, especially in the urban areas. So the U.S. has long had Syria in its, uh, in its uh, gun sites for a variety of reasons. Some of you will remember during the Cold War, Syria was uh, an ally of the Soviet Union and has remained an ally of uh, the Russians since the end of the Cold War. Uh, and uh, despite uh, on and off again attempts to come to some kind of agreement with Syria, it was always going to be impossible so long as Israel occupied part of Syria. And the U.S. was never going to pressure Israel to give up the part of Syria and the Golan Heights that it occupied. So since 2007, it's pretty well established that the U.S. had a strategic plan following the invasion of Iraq that Syria was the next target. And uh, there's lots of documents that have come through that the U.S. made a commitment to overthrow the state in Syria and to try to install a puppet regime as they tr attempted to do in Iraq. And the beginning of the Arab revolt 
the, the Arab Spring in 2010, 2011, gave a kind of entry for them to try to apply this policy. Uh, some of you are familiar. I mean, obviously, all the authoritarian regimes in the Arab world uh, were oppressive, sometimes corrupt. And the movement that started in North Africa and Tunisia uh, and, uh, and Egypt uh, to try to have democratic change uh, was frustrated in those places. But the U.S. thought they could use that uh, sentiment within Syria to basically crush, uh, uh, and crush the country and have regime change. And in Syria, there was another factor that didn't exist elsewhere, which I think is important to point out. Uh, Syria underwent a very severe drought in uh, 2006, 7, and 8. Uh, and it's shown on these maps, the areas that are brown uh, were the parts of Syria that were hit badly by a drought. So there was a lot of disturbance within Syria. A lot of rural people whose farms became unworkable because of the climate change moved to the cities, the big cities, and lived in, you know, relatively impoverished uh, outlying neighborhoods around the big cities in slums, essentially, and were, you know, pretty impoverished and were uh, vulnerable to influence by uh, extremist uh, uh, Sunni uh, Saudi Arabian financed clerics who were organizing them and agitating them against uh, against the government of Syria and against the idea of Syria as a multi-ethnic secular state. So part of the background of Syria, it may be the first modern country where uh, climate change had a political uh, uh, ramification, and uh, we may be seeing more of that in the future. So most of you know, people have this idea that uh, you know, peaceful protests broke out in 2000, early 2011 against the government, uh, that supposedly in our narrative they wanted a sort of secular democratic Syria. Uh, and in fact, uh, this was only part of the story. Uh, there was a sectarian Sunni and extremist uh, element to the opposition to the government right from the start. Uh, and uh, also, if not at the very, very beginning, very soon it became armed. Armed not uh, spontaneously, but because Saudi Arabia, Qatar, the U.S., and Turkey poured billions of dollars of weapons into Syria to give them, you know, to give to the, to the rebels, and very quickly the stakes ro rose. In other words, what started as a reform movement became a regime change movement financed and supported by outside countries. And, and planned, uh, uh, you know, pre-planned, if, if yes. can we say that. Yes. Yeah. So this narrative that people have uh, that this was all peaceful, secular, democratic uh, opposition to the government that was then crushed by the regime and took up arms somehow uh, to defend themselves, this is a, a very distorted view of what actually happened. Uh, the prime thrust of the opposition to the government was always had a strong sectarian Sunni Islamist uh, core, and from very, very early on, it was armed by outside powers uh, as an attempt to overthrow the government. And again, it's 10 years ago, but at the beginning of what was called the Syrian revolt, uh, most of the casualties were uh, government security people who were not armed at the beginning of the, you know, the uh, demonstrations and protests, uh, government buildings and police officers were killed in their dozens. And it was only then that the war began to be militarized and took up this, uh, you know, crisis that we view as this sometimes called the Syrian civil war, although it was a civil war in which one side was backed by billions of dollars in money from the United States and its allies. Uh, in my view, the hardcore supporters of, uh, of the government and the hardcore opponents are both minorities in Syria. Uh, the big middle, what I consider the majority, are Syrians of various faiths and origins who, as you said, see the government with lots of problems but as the lesser evil compared to the alternative. And I like to point out my friend, this is Abdul Razak, who was a, a tour guide uh, in, that I met in uh, in Damascus in 2018, uh, a Sunni Muslim, uh, not very religious, uh, but a Sunni who, who had plenty of criticism of the government. Uh, and he said, 
you know, when the war is over, maybe he'll become an oppositionist, a political oppositionist. But as he put it now, uh, you don't argue about what color to paint the walls when your house is burning down. Absolutely. So he, like a majority of Syrians, in my view, believes that, yes, they want reforms, but first they want to keep their state and to keep a secular country. That's the number one. And it's something that Americans have trouble understanding. Yeah, we believe in democracy. We want democracy. But without democracy, it makes a difference whether people can at least live in their private lives the way they want or to live under a kind of Saudi Arabia-type uh, religious dictatorship. Uh, so, so in my view, this is this view is the the one that ma the majority of Syrians hold. That is, uh, they want reforms, uh, but uh, first the war has to be won, and there has to be peace, and then they'll push for reforms. So, what we don't hear about in this narrative is the fact that uh, after the beginning of these protests, millions of Syrians demonstrated in support of their government. You will never see a picture like this in our mainstream uh, media. This is from Damascus uh, in October 2011. And this is from Aleppo. And just as a reminder, uh, before the crisis in 2010, the Ba'ath Party had approximately 2 million members. This is in a country of 21 or 22 million Two million members is a fairly substantial social base, especially when you add their families and relatives and so on. So the government, as undemocratic as it was, was not without support. Uh, and uh, in particular, uh, the ethnic and religious minorities within Syria, whatever they felt about their government, were intensely fearful of what would happen if the opposition took control. Uh, that is, Syria, you know, their view was not a democratic, secular Syria, but an Islamist state ruled by Sharia law. And the fear was that the minorities in Syria would have no home in a country ruled by the opposition. Self-preservation, I mean, at the yes, end of the day. Yes. So I'm going to play, I hope this little video uh, plays. This was a, uh, a parade uh, uh, in Homs in 2017. Uh, for a youth festival, but it shows the sort of ethnic and religious diversity in Syria. Uh, and of course, these are all people that were supporting the government. Let's see if it'll play. So you can see Palestinians, Christians of various kinds, Armenians, Sunni Muslims, Shia Muslims. Not only Muslim, but secular. And, and this you see the flavor of that. That is that that for many of these people, their understanding was as 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 bad as their government was in many respects. Uh, it was that or something worse. Correct. <laughs> And, uh, and, uh, and that explains why the government didn't fall, because there was a strong residue of support for it, or at least fear of the alternative. Well, uh, Well-founded fear, by the way. Correct. And, and, and that's, the, that's the biggest issue, is uh, uh, all these people would love to have a secular country with, uh, with democracy and, right. and all the institutions that come with that and all that. But at the end of the day, everybody knew from day one, whoever is going to replace the current uh, government is going to be absolutely worse right. than, than what it is. So I'd rather keep the, 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 you know, the government as it is uh, in their thoughts than, than have to deal with this, especially, again, uh, uh, mention uh, people saw what happened in Iraq and, and, and uh, in Libya when there was regime change. And, and by the way, in response to the uh, beginning of the protests in 2011, the government did institute significant reforms, uh, uh, ending the state of emergency, ending the uh, exclusive right of the Ba'ath Party to organize, giving Kurdish uh, uh, population citizenship rights, which some of them did not have, and so on. So 
there was a reform in response to it, but reform wasn't what the opponents were looking for. They were looking to overthrow the state and institute a religious regime, a kind of extremist religious regime. And in fact, among most of the uh, armed opposition groups, democracy was considered sinful. They were not supporting democracy. There are more Syrian democratic supporters today in New York and Washington, D.C. than there are in Syria itself. Right. And I'll submit to you that, that uh, uh, if, if they had won, if the, this, this quote-unquote opposition had won, uh, it would have been the de facto uh, uh, disintegration of the country. Here's another aspect that people are confused about. There are an estimated five or six million external refugees uh, fleeing Syria. And the idea that's promulgated here is that all of them are opposed to the government when we're fleeing the government. In fact, there were a variety of reasons why people left. For the most part, it was fleeing the war, which people do, uh, and uh, sometimes seeking a better life and so on. And, uh, you know, not all of them are, uh, are, you know, opposed to the government. And we saw that in 2014. Again, this goes down the memory hole, right? In 2014, when presidential elections were held, uh, thousands of uh, Syrian refugees lined up in Beirut and Amman to vote. And uh, many of them uh, vocally supporting of Bashar al-Assad uh, for president. So this idea that all the refugees are, you know, somehow opposed to the government is another one of those uh, things that are just not, uh, not correct. So the opposition... Uh, understood, you know, once it was clear that the Syrian state was going to uh, survive, their only hope for regime change was outside uh, intervention, direct outside intervention. That is, not only supplying money and arms, but an invasion. And their model for this was Libya. Uh, in 2011, uh, the U.S. and France, uh, in the name of NATO, uh, basically served as the air force in Libya to overthrow Gaddafi. And you may remember, of course, he was overthrown and then murdered. Uh, and the, the armed opposition in Syria were hopeful that this would happen in their country, too, especially after Barack Obama had said in the summer of 2011 that Assad had to go. Uh, a lot of the Syrian opposition believed the bombers would follow soon and bomb Assad out of power. And you can see in this picture, this is one uh, town held by the rebels then. Uh, in which they're basically begging for NATO to come and bomb their country. And down below, you can see a picture on the right, uh, a caricature of Gaddafi and one of Assad. Uh, Gaddafi had recently been murdered. And you may remember uh, that uh, in 2016, when Donald Trump won uh, the presidency, he wasn't the only sociopath running for president, in my view. Uh, this is... Hillary Clinton celebrating the uh, murder of Gaddafi. We came, we saw, he <laughs> <you> died. <laughs> did it have anything to do with your visit? No, I'm not sure it did. I mean, imagine that. She's like giggling about uh, a person who was tortured and uh, murdered. So it didn't happen. For whatever reason, the U.S. decided they weren't going to intervene in that way in Syria, again, hoping that the, the, the state would fall on its own, but it didn't happen. So I want to remind everybody, as much as we hate Trump for all kinds of reasons, that it was Barack Obama who began the U.S. intervention in Syria, not uh, Donald Trump. And in fact, ironically, Donald Trump had his misgivings about it. So Obama spent billions of dollars in U.S. arms uh, to Syria, and, you know, searched for the democratic opposition that they could empower in Syria and never managed to find it because there was no armed democratic opposition in Syria. There were just Islamists, Al-Qaeda, and ISIS of various threads. So basically this U.S. money went down the, down the drain. And, and it seemed Syria like... Syria paid price for it. Yeah, and it seemed like every Islamist from all over the world... That's right. ...in Syria. It was, yeah. You know, it, it, we, we seem to think about the opposition as being Syrian, as being a Syrian opposition, be it armed or, or, or otherwise. But in actuality, yes, of course, there were some Syrians, 
but the majority were from all over the world. It's yeah. like the plane pouring into from all over the world. Yeah, I, I'm going to actually show a map of it. But just, uh, you know, for the time being, there were so many different uh, Islamist groups. Every foreign country, every foreign billionaire had their own group that they bought and paid for. And there were dozens of them. And again, what they had in common was that none of them believed in a secular democratic Syria. They all wanted to impose uh, a religious, exclusive, fundamentalist religious regime on Syria that the majority of Syrians do not want. And again, as you said, uh, foreigners were encouraged to go to Syria from all over the world and were easily able to enter through Turkey primarily, but also Jordan, uh, funded and financed by Gulf petro monarchs and Qatar and Saudi Arabia and so on, and as many as 50 or 70,000 international uh, jihadist warriors entered Syria, and many of them are still there today. Uh, and uh, these are not Syrian patriots and not Democrats by any means. Uh, if you look at the picture on the, the lower right, uh, this is one group, and of course they're carrying uh, Al-Qaeda flags, not, uh, not uh, Syrian Democratic flags, although when the cameras are rolling, They'll show that, uh, you know, that three-star flag, uh, you know, for the benefit of the West, but that's not really what their ideology is. So the government suffered some, you know, military defeats in the early years of, uh, of uh, the conflict, and, but it wasn't until 2013 that it got significant foreign help. And it's important to realize that is years after the U.S. and its allies were pouring money and guns into Syria only then did the Syrians get help from outside, in the first place from Hezbollah in Lebanon. And what you're seeing here, this was 2013. Uh, these are uh, volunteers from a village that I know very well near Baalbek uh, who are on their way to fight in Qusair in, uh, in, uh, in Syria. And you can see they're holding Hezbollah flags. From their point of view, they were defending their co-religionists in Syria and also defending Lebanon because these jihadists were on the border of Lebanon and were infiltrating the country too and threatening the Lebanese as well. So Hezbollah uh, entered on the side of the government partly to support them and partly as self-defense. And this started to turn the tide. And later on, uh, the Russians and the Iranians uh, amped up their support for the government. And most Syrians are quite grateful for this. You see posters like this all over Syria. And uh, for those of you who can't sit, tell from the left, it's Hassan Nasrallah, the, the head of uh, Hezbollah, and Rouhani, the, uh, the president of, uh, of Iran, Assad, and then, and then uh, Vladimir Putin on the right, who, uh, especially for the Christians in Syria, is regarded as the person that saved, their, saved the, you know, the existence of their communities. And I've heard Syrians refer to Putin as Abu Ali. So, uh, you know, basically, they came to the aid of Syria when they needed it and helped to turn the tide. And, of course, uh, the, big, the big turn of the tide came in the defeat of the, uh, of the rebels that were occupying the eastern part of Aleppo. Aleppo never had an indigenous uprising. It was armed militants from outside Aleppo that conquered part of the city early on in, the, in 2012. And uh, basically, for a long time, it was the, uh, the modern city of Aleppo that was under siege from the rebels until the end of 2016, when, uh, with the help of the Russians and the Iranians, uh, they were defeated. And from the point of view of the, our mainstream media, this was the fall of Aleppo, right? This was the destruction of Aleppo. From the point of view of millions of Syrians, this was the liberation of Aleppo. And uh, I'm going to play a little bit of a clip here. Now, obviously, this is a pro-government, you know, uh, video, but you have to believe your eyes. People are out in the streets of Aleppo celebrating. This was just before Christmas in 2016. And, of course, Aleppo is a multicultural ci city. You know, uh, Muslims mark Christmas in Aleppo just as Christians mark Ramadan. You know, that's the way... People coexist in the Middle East uh, when they're left to their own. So, this is playing. This is people in Aleppo celebrating uh, the liberation of their city and, uh, and, and 
removing themselves from the danger of rebel mortar attacks and rocket attacks. Okay, so obviously not every Syrian feels that way, but these are the Syrians we never see or hear about in the United States, right? Everybody mourns the fall of Aleppo, the destruction of Aleppo. The fact that millions of Syrians were celebrating is something we're not allowed uh, ever to hear about. Yeah, that, well, that goes against the narrative. So. Yes, yes, exactly. So uh, if we fast forward to today, this was Syria at uh, the point where the government was weakest. That is, its control was pretty much confined to a narrow strip. It even then included most of the population centers of, of uh, Syria, but the rest of the country was ruled uh, by the armed opposition, either in the north, the south, by ISIS in the middle of the country. Uh, and since 2016 and recent years, little by little, the government took control of most of the rest of the country. So this, this, uh, this map on the right uh, shows the situation today with government-controlled areas in blue. Uh, the red areas are parts of Syria occupied by Turkey. Uh, and the green is the part of Syria that's occupied by the United States and its Kurdish allies. And of course, this is what Trump bragged about. Uh, the eastern part of Syria is where Syria's oil and wheat comes from. So uh, Trump, we secure the oil, and of course there are American oil companies that have got contracts to uh, exploit Syrian oil, protected by the U.S. Army, and uh, it's one of the reasons why we'll see there's a sort of economic crisis in Syria today, is because the U.S. is using their occupation, a part of Syria, to starve the rest of the country. So what are the problems in Syria today? The medical and health care system is really, really uh, devastated. Uh, by the war and the sanctions. In, in 2018, we met with uh, Elizabeth Hoff, who is the uh, World Health Organization representative in Syria, who explained that Syria once had, before the war, had a really advanced health care system. Uh, free medical care was available. It had a really robust indigenous pharmaceutical industry that served almost all its needs. Uh, all of this healthcare infrastructure was devastated by the war and by the sanctions. A lot of it was simply destroyed uh, in the fighting, hospitals and uh, clinics and factories. Uh, a lot of it just is not functional because they can't get spare parts for their machinery and their laboratories. Uh, so that healthcare is in a shambles in Syria today, and people are dying because of it. Uh, those with money. Uh, can get sometimes get treatment in Lebanon if they have enough cash uh, in advance to pay, but the average people in, in Syria cannot get medical care at all, and of course that's compounded by COVID now, which is uh, which is present in Syria too. So this is the result of our war, uh, a, a country which had uh, you know was able to take care of its own health needs is now you know suffering you know the consequences of that war and the sanctions especially, and this woman. It was not a partisan of the government at all. I mean, she's uh, the representative of the World Health Organization and was very adamant that the sanctions are killing Syrians by denying them health care. Syria was also, again, people don't know, Syria was a fairly industrialized country uh, before the war. Uh, and its industry was targeted by the rebels, especially Aleppo was the industrial center of, of, of the country. And... Uh, Parts of those areas were taken over in 2012 and after by armed rebels, and they basically destroyed every factory that they could uh, and sold the machinery to the Turks. There are pictures of convoys of trucks carrying Syrian machinery to be sold in Turkey. And when we visited, this Sheikh Najjar industrial area was now again in the hands of the government, and people were starting to rebuild. And interestingly, we visited uh, a couple of factories uh, on the left was a, uh, uh, a textile, a, a cotton spinning factory. Above it, uh, a plastics molding factory. And the new rebuilt factories are all supplied with Chinese machinery because China is, uh, is willing to supply and sell machinery to uh, Syria as the U.S. and the Europeans are not any longer. So this is 
probably the best hope for revival in Syria is to find partners in Russia, Iran, and China to help them rebuild their country because the Europeans and Americans have no interest in doing that. So the sanctions, combined with the fact that the U.S. occupies the eastern part of the country, which is the breadbasket of Syria and where oil comes from, has led to a crisis of hunger in Syria today. Uh, bread is becoming scarce, and you can see on the upper picture uh, a line, people waiting in line for bread. For the poor in Syria, bread is the principal staple of uh, everyday life, and uh, it's a struggle to get enough bread in Syria now, a uh, struggle both to uh, because they can't access the wheat in their own country and because U.S. sanctions make it hard for them to import wheat from outside. So the U.S. is imposing hunger on Syria. And also, uh, because Syria can't access its own petroleum uh, uh, you know, resources, uh, there's a shortage of gasoline and even, even more difficult fuel for its power plants and for heating. Again, people who are not familiar with the Middle East think it's always hot, but winters are cold in Syria and people are freezing because they can't get heating oil. Uh, to, to uh, heat their, uh, their houses and apartments, and of course can't get gasoline, and electricity is sometimes only an hour or two a day in different places as this kind of rolling blackouts. Uh, this is due to damage to the electrical infrastructure and the fact that they can't get oil. And when the Iranians are trying to bring oil to Syria, the, the only you know, country willing to break the uh, U.S. embargo, uh, their uh, oil tankers have been very frequently attacked and sabotaged by the Israelis as they're uh, sailing on the way to, uh, uh, to Syria. So this happens frequently, frequently enough. I just want to end by, uh, with a couple of pictures that, from 2016 that to me illustrate what's at stake in Syria for the Syrians and for people who care about the Syrians. You know, we had a delegation, you can see here, the man in the middle, the tall guy in the middle is the governor of Homs province that we met with. And, you know, some of you travel, you know, these meetings, you know, sometimes they're interesting, but basically it's, you know, sort of propaganda, kind of, you know, yawn. Uh, it was nice to hear his point of view, but inadvertently we had a different view that was much more informative. After the meeting with the governor, he invited us next door to the theater, next to the city hall. And pretty amazingly, in the middle of the war, this was a meeting uh, to promulgate better care and, and less discrimination against people with learning disabilities in Syria. Some of you may know in the Arab world, they haven't always treated people with learning disabilities or physical disabilities so well. You know, they're a little bit stigmatized. And the government of Syria uh, was trying to promote better views toward, uh, you know, treating disabled people. And they were holding this meeting to educate people about kids with Down syndrome. Uh, who, you know, should, should be treated, you know, humanely and, you know, given opportunities to be in society and learn. And it was very touching. At one point on the stage were these kids and their mothers. You know, really, I'm almost uh, coming to tears just remembering it now. Uh, it was very touching. And this is the good part of Syria that we never hear about. And this is the part of Syria that these rebels want to destroy. Yeah, and, and, it's and we're helping them. It's amazing to me now seeing this, that they actually made the time and put the effort That's into right. this when they have a million and one other thing. That's uh, right. That they That's need right. To it was very moving. And, of course, you know, if anyone suspects, this was not put on for our benefit. This is something that, you know, as you saw, had, you know, a lot of an auditorium filled with people, and it was just a coincidence that it happened to be going on when we were visiting. And, you know, so this is, this is a little bit of a hint of what Syria could be if they were left to uh, live in peace and develop on their own. And nearby, we visited the ruins of, uh, uh, of a uh, Catholic church in, in Homs that was, had been destroyed by the rebels and was being rebuilt. And just opposite the church was a newly opened cafe in which young men and young women were meeting together and socializing, uh, something that is unimaginable in the so-called rebel-held areas of Syria. Correct. Uh, and and uh, 
And I want to end with this because this was on the wall of that cafe. Uh, and the picture on the right is uh, uh, schoolgirls on their way to school that we happen to pass. And on the wall of this cafe was this very touching uh, uh, thing. This was the English version. Uh, in this neighborhood, we suffered. We went through difficult times. We fled our homes. Today, we may still suffer difficult times, but we are holding on to our land, believing the sun will rise again, promising ourselves to go always and then in Arabic forward. Uh, so this is the hope for Syria. And, uh, you know, this is the Syria that we should be supporting, that people of goodwill should be supporting, and wishing them peace and the ability to have a better and reformed government, which will only be possible if the war is over, frankly. They won't. It's impossible to have meaningful reforms while the government is fighting for its life against foreign intervention. It's no longer a, a military problem only or, or, a, or a, you know, just war, but now uh, the war is, is the sanctions and uh, people desperate uh, for food. And, and I'll let you answer this. Uh, I have my own feelings on this, but I, I think that this is uh, part of the equation in that if we get enough people hungry, maybe that uh, those people will rise up and say, you know what, if we get rid of you, then maybe we can eat again. Yes, yes. So this is the hope uh, of uh, the interventionists and the U.S. government. Uh, it's not working so far, and I hope the Syrians will manage to uh, survive. They are little by little rebuilding parts of their country, but it's very difficult for them. And, of course, a lot of Syrians have left. Uh, there's a kind of brain drain. The ones who have the means to leave, uh, many of them have done so, living in the United States and elsewhere. And, by the way, uh, it's very common... Uh, to quote, you know, people speaking for the Syrians here, you know, Syrian-Americans or Syrians. And, of course, you know, that means only speaking for some of the Syrians. Uh, many Syrians here who have left for the benefit of their families uh, have no uh, illusions about the democratic nature of those who want to overthrow the Syrian state. But they're intimidated. You know, if you're a Syrian that comes here and you're looking for citizenship, you're not going to say, I love Bashar al-Assad. Uh, everyone who comes here understands that their ticket for saying, staying in the United States is, you know, long live democracy, down with Assad, whatever they may believe privately. But so those are the only people we hear from, and the Syrians who have a different point of view are kind of keeping their heads down because it's a, you know, it's a, it's a dangerous view to hold in the United States. And the, the Syrians who pretend to talk for the Syrians, many organizations are deeply, deeply funded by the U.S. and other governments, the Syrian American Medical Society, the Syrian Emergency Task Force. There's a whole alphabet soup of supposedly pro-democratic Syrian organizations in the United States that get millions of dollars in funding. And uh, if you scratch below the surface, for the most part, they are uh, strongly influenced by Islamist thinking as well, although they pretend to be Democrats for purposes of public relations. So uh, this is the situation. And uh, if we care, and by the way, this idea that the U.S. is intervening around the world for democracy has killed more people than the Nazis did in the Holocaust. If we add up the deaths that were caused by U.S. intervention uh, sometimes in the, in theoretically to promote democracy in Korea, in Vietnam, in the Middle East. Uh, we killed more people uh, through those interventions than the Nazis killed in the Holocaust. Four million in Korea, two or three million in Vietnam, a million in Iraq. You add it up. And that's the price that the rest of the world pays for U.S. sort of imperial interventions. Uh, but we're bringing democracy to these places. Right. Right, right. And it's very possible, by the way, if the U.S. and its allies had not intervened in Syria early on and during the protests, that we might see today a reformed and democratic Syria. Uh, this was a process that was beginning. And anyway, we certainly know for sure the worst case scenario would have been that the government clamped down on the opposition and kept its dictatorship. 
but hundreds of thousands of Syrians would be alive today who aren't. You know, the price that Syrians have paid for the U.S. and foreign intervention in their country is no change, but hundreds of thousands of people dead. And, and they're still paying that price today. Yeah. And I think uh, today their, their situation is even worse than it was uh, a few years ago. Yeah. Uh, because sanctions have been proven over the years to be one of the most uh, uh, or, or the best weapon against countries like that because right. Right. Uh, uh, you suffocate them. You literally suffocate them uh, uh, slowly, uh, but you eventually do suffocate them. So we, you know, I work with Massachusetts Peace Action. We oppose uh, sanctions and interventions by the U.S. no matter what the pretense is because the experience shows that sanctions uh, make ordinary people suffer and don't, are not effective in bringing democracy, even if that was the, the purpose of it, which generally speaking it's not. And intervention, however bad a country may be, when the U.S. intervenes, it becomes worse in Syria. Uh, because of uh, the U.S. and its allies funding these these armed oppositionists, many more Syrians were killed than had ever suffered at the hands of the government, as bad as it may have been. So we're opposed, absolutely opposed. If we want democracy, let's start with Saudi Arabia, is what we say. If we want democracy, let's stop selling billions of dollars worth of arms to Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Republic, Egypt, and Israel. That wouldn't kill people. It would just take the weapons out of the hands of dictatorship. And uh, if we want to show our, our well-meaning of democracy, let's start there. I think that's, that's the, the place to go. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, uh, Jeff, thank you very, very much uh, for being with us today. Uh, this was definitely informative, and uh, we greatly appreciate your time and efforts. And uh, we hope to have you back on. I mean, there's so much to talk about Syria, but... Uh, uh, we'll leave it here for now, and uh, again, thank you very much for being with us. Thank you, and I'm sorry to go on so long. There's a lot of information that people lack about Syria, so uh, apologies if I've taken a long time. Please, but, please uh, don't, don't apologize. It was definitely informative, and, and hopefully our audience finds it uh, uh, that way as okay. well. Well, thank you. I'm happy to be here and happy to come back if you want. <laughs> All right, fantastic. We'll definitely have you on. Thank you very much, Jeff. Great. Thank you.